This chapter we're going to talk about the most important laws in classical physics. These are Newton's laws of motion. And classical mechanics really talks about how things move or why things move um, as we understood them really up until the 20th century. Okay? It didn't end with what Newton did. Newton did really the most important uh, foundation of this. It did continue with others uh, such as Lagrange and, and Hamilton. But really what we present here is the, the basis for, for classical physics before we got into the 1900s and we started looking at quantum mechanics, the study of motion of the very small, and relativity. So again, uh, quantum mechanics was developed after classical mechanics, obviously. Um, it was really to handle some problems that we couldn't explain with regular classical mechanics and classical electrodynamics. And um, eventually we had to come up with a whole new theory about how things would behave on a very, very small scale. Relativistic mechanics was developed primarily by Einstein, and he developed his special relativity law in 1905, with the help of uh, some mathematicians, developed his general law in 1915. We know that Newton's laws break down whenever our speeds get very, very fast. We get close to the speed of light, or in the case where the acceleration of gravity becomes very, very large. But other than that, just about everything in our world behaves according to the laws of classical mechanics. Just about everything we see can be described in terms of its motion, the change in motion, in terms of Newton's laws. Again, there were others who came after him in classical mechanics, such as Lagrange and Hamilton, who made it easier to solve some of these problems, but it was really Newton who laid the foundation for how things move. In fact, in developing classical mechanics, he actually developed uh, calculus in order to uh, come up with equations for these motions. So again, as long as we're not too small, we can just apply all the laws of class classical mechanics and they're, they're going to work. And as long as we're not going too fast or we have um, a gravitational field that uh, has a very, very high acceleration like near a black hole, classical mechanics will work for that too. And again, we're still working today trying to explain um, other phenomena. Quantum mechanics does very well on the small scale. Relativity does very well for um, intense gravitational fields, but when we combine quantum mechanics and relativity, um, we have some, some difficulty there. And uh, we do have some theories that take us a little bit beyond just uh, normal quantum mechanics. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to quantize gravity, that's uh, the edge of, uh, of physics right now. You might have heard of string theory, it's really M theory is, is attempting to do that. So, we start out by introducing the idea of a force. Force is any push or pull that acts on an object. Now, in the previous chapter, we, chapters, we've talked about how things move, okay? Can we describe their motion? We call this kinematics. Now we're going to apply a force and see why they move the way they do. So, again, force is a push or a pull. Um, again, uh, a push or a pull, it's going to have a vector quantity, so it'll have magnitude and direction. This could be a contact force or a field force. And truthfully, contact forces are actually field forces where two objects, electrons, are electrically interacting with one another. Um, so really, all forces in some direct or indirect way are um, given by some fundamental force of nature. Okay? Again, a contact force, um, things can be directly connected and therefore the atoms in contact with one another are creating this force. Here are some different contact forces. Here we're uh, using a spring to generate a force. Here we're generating tension to generate a force. Here we have a normal force, two surfaces. And again, field forces can include gravity. We can have field forces such as the electric force. We can have field forces such as the magnetic force. And even the strong and weak nuclear forces also create um, 
the same effect. So our fundamental forces in nature include gravity. We've already seen that gravity produces an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. Um, electromagnetic forces will handle more in physics 2, and strong and weak nuclear forces we handle in physics 3. Um, gravity is probably the weakest force by mass. The electromagnetic force actually combines electrical forces and magnetic forces, and the strong and nuclear forces are forces onto themselves. Now again, um, characteristics of all field forces um, basically, uh, you know, will behave according to uh, what they're acting on. Um, most field forces can be attractive and repulsive. Uh, only gravity is a force which is uh, entirely attractive to the best of our knowledge. Again, gravity is the, the weakest of the forces by mass, pound for pound, if you will. Um, however, because it's always attractive, it can result in some of the largest forces in the universe. Uh, it just takes a lot of matter to create them. The electromagnetic force is sort of intermediate in terms of its strength. Um, it involves both electric and magnetic fields. Uh, it involves forces on charged particles. And of course, a strong force acts at very short distances. And although pound for pound is the most powerful force, the strong force has one of the shortest distances of action, and the weak force is even shorter in terms of, of its distance of action. Let's get to classical mechanics. Sir Isaac Newton um, was probably one of the most important physicists in all of history. Galileo, of course, was important uh, because of the way that he um, made the experiment uh, important to our understanding. He really was a father of science. But Newton really started uh, classical um, mechanics um, building on what, uh, you know, some of what uh, Galileo did. Newton was born in Woolsthorpe, England on Christmas Day. He was uh, the son of a widow. His uh, mother was pregnant at the time that uh, his father passed away. And unfortunately for Newton, this set, set him up for uh, a bad situation. He came from um, a fairly wealthy family, uh, you know, not exceedingly rich, but not uh, poor by any, any means. And Newton's mother, uh, being a woman in England, couldn't uh, hold property. So she was forced to remarry, and uh, the uh, church official, the, the vicar who she married, uh, insisted on her previous children being sent back to the family farm. So basically, uh, Newton was given up to his grandparents, and uh, this created um, quite a bit of animosity uh, between Newton, not surprisingly, his mother and his stepfather. And um, I think when he went for um, what would be his confirmation in the church, he had to uh, confess his sins, and one of the sins he confessed to was uh, fantasizing about burning his mother and stepfather alive uh, in their house. So uh, he was, uh, he didn't take kindly to his, um, his, uh, his place. In any case, uh, he was an average student at best in what would be the equivalent of our elementary, middle school, and high school. But uh, one of the teachers uh, saw great promise in Newton, and uh, he encouraged him to attend the University of Cambridge. And the University of Cambridge was a very good school, but it wasn't the um, school that it is today. In fact, University of Cambridge has its great reputation starting from uh, Newton being both a student and a professor there. So, uh, you know, Cambridge is famous for, New for Newton rather than Newton being famous for Cambridge. So, um, Newton started as a student. Uh, like many, you know, very promising student, he was asked to stay on as a faculty member. And five years after he started, Newton um, is forced to go back to his family farm because London is uh, under a plague. 
And uh, basically, if you had money, Newton had money, you could go to the countryside where you were safe from the plague. If you didn't have money and you were in London, well, things were just about waiting it out and hoping that you didn't die from the plague. He's sent back to the family farm for two years where he does work, and he makes most of his discoveries there. Uh, when the plague subsided, he returned to Cambridge. He eventually published the work that he did over the plague years, and he published it in a work called the Principia. And this was done, I believe, at the insistence of uh, Edmund Halley, of course, who discovered Halley's Comet, because Halley was very impressed on what Newton had discovered. Um, this book contained theories about gravity and motion, and basically contained Newton's three laws, which we'll be talking about here. Later in life, Newton, uh, due to his fame, was um, uh, elected to the prestigious Royal Society. The Ro Royal Society would decide matters of math and um, science or natural philosophy in England. And uh, he was appointed here, or elected here, after he invented the reflecting telescope, which is the basis for all research telescopes today. Um, he was also elected to Parliament, but um, really didn't do very much in Parliament. Um, it said that the only thing that he ever said was, uh, you know, somebody should close a window before we get a cold. Um, but when he was appointed to the Royal Mint, he actually had a profound effect on the English economy. Most people don't know this, but at the time of Newton, counterfeiting was a huge problem. And with the economy, if you cannot be confident in you know, the, the pound notes that were being sent around, that they were real, then basically the economy grinds to a halt because nobody will pay for anything for fear that they might take in a counterfeit bill. So Newton figures out how to prevent the counterfeiting, and he even finds the counterfeiter, or the person responsible for the counterfeiting, who's a member of, of the uh, English government. Uh, this person was uh, put to death uh, for a counterfeiting. His head was placed on a pike, and Newton became a hero. In fact, Newton becomes so famous, he's actually uh, buried in Westminster Abbey. He's the first non-royal uh, to receive such an honor. And that really shows the extent of his fame by the time uh, he passed away. Uh, so Newton, um, you know, is a, is a stark difference in terms of uh, his fortunes compared to Galileo. Galileo sort of ends his life in disgrace and uh, is buried in secret. And um, Newton is given a, a king's burial and uh, is honored as a hero and is placed at a very high level in government. Um, so again, Newton did um, a number of things. We're going to talk mainly about his work on mechanics. But he did show that white light could be broken down into all the colors of the visible spectrum. And he is credited, as we said, with developing the reflective telescope. Newton also developed calculus. And um, he's given a co-invention of calculus with Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Eventually, Newton develops his uh, law of uh, universal gravity. And this theory becomes um, important because it shows that gravity pretty much holds everything together. Now, in the early chapters, we're probably going to just concentrate on Newton's laws of gravity more. And of course, his first law is uh, the law of inertia, which is connected with uh, Galileo's study of inertia.